his structure interaction according to cultural norms that impede character participation. Can you see that that example of xenophobia is impeding parity of participation there? Because you've been charged more fees or you're not being you're not being able to access grants. Examples include marriage laws that exclude same-sex partnerships as illegitimate and perverse, social welfare poli policies that stigmatize single mothers as sexually irresponsible scroungers, and policing practices such as racial profiling that associate racialized pers persons with criminality. So those are all institutional you know, instances. In each of these cases, interaction is regulated by institutionalized patterns of cultural value that constitute some categories of social actors as normative and others as deficient or inferior. Straight is normal, gay is perverse, male-headed households are proper, female-headed households not. Whites are law-abiding, blacks are dangerous. So she's referring to these examples above. So they hold groups of people that are sort of um, seen as less than. And actually, um, people like Rosie Bradotti or Erin Manning and Brian Masumi talk about how the um, sort of able white, able-bodied, middle-class economic man is the sort of normative student in higher education. And if you fall outside these categories, you know, the social arrangements, you know, don't accommodate them. I've just externally examined a thesis on disability in Australia, at the University of Western Australia, where she used Nancy Fraser to look at how um, disability. She looked at, at. She interviewed st students who were living with disabilities and lecturers, and she showed how um, you know the, the the policies tend to medicalize people. Although you are given a trajectory, some people don't want to actually come out that that they are um, disabled, particularly in fields like social work where it's going to be held against you. So for their placements, they weren't saying, actually, I, you know, I have a mental health issue, because they were scared that they wouldn't be employed there in the future. So, um, you know, it's whole groups of people that are regarded as not normative. And, um, you know, the, the common sense in society doesn't contest this. I mean, you, have, you know, it has to be pointed out. Okay, so what is the remedy for injustice and misrecognition? So this is very important. Um, according to Nancy Fraser, it is not aimed at repairing psychical damage, but rather at overcoming subordination claims for recognition in the status model. So they, it's rather seeking to establish the subordinated part party is a full partner in social life, able to interact with each other as, as a peer. So you're not repairing psychological damage. You're trying to make it possible for that person to interact on a path. Say a disabled student or um, you should be putting the social arrangements in place at university for that student to be able to participate on an equal basis with others, and that might be giving people extra time or giving being more flexible in arrangements. And it might be that difference in itself is accommodated in the classroom and is seen as normative, rather than seeing somebody as, you know, this particular person is the person who would succeed in higher education. Um, the status model conceives of recognition as a status subordination and locates the wrong in social relations, not in individual or in interpersonal psychology. She's not one bit interested in psychology or what it means to a person. 
revaluing disrespected identities or devalued trays and cultural products of malign groups, say knowledges, cultural products or knowledges, recognizing and positively valorizing cultural diversity, that's what I spoke about, difference, transforming societal patterns of representation, like who gets into the media, what goes on in the in social media, interpretation and communication in ways that would change everyone's social identity. So, first when applied to misrecognition, affirmative remedies tend to reify collective identities. For example, black students or women students. This was your point, Renal. So, um, it's affirmative, it's like saying, you know, it's it's a sort of black consciousness position where, you know, if you're black, then um, you try to revalue that group or revaluing a gay identity. She says that's an affirmative way of dealing with it. Valorizing group identity, especially along a single axis, they drastically simplify people's self-understandings, denying the complexity of lives the multiplicity of their identifications and the cross pools of their various. So we are not just one category. We are, a, you know, complex social relation which changes depending on where we find ourselves. At their worst, moreover, such approaches tend to pressure individuals to conform to a group type, discouraging dissonance and experimentation, which are effectively equated with disloyalty. So, I mean, I think, you know, my view and, say, uh, my daughter's view of um, feminism, for example, are completely different. You know, she's a, a young student at university, and she said to me she's doing a research project on cisgender men. And then she said to me, she interviewed them, she said, you know what, some of them were under the illusion that they could be feminists. You know, they were, mis they were so confused that they thought that they might be feminists. So I said, but I don't understand that because for me, you know, cisgender men can be feminists. She said, no, that's not their territory. You know, they must ask to be um, included. So for me, this is, this is a sort of um, an affirmative way of looking at identity, which I think is a... Is, is a the current trend among young people. Concerned academics during the student protests. You know, there were a group of people who call themselves mm, the concerned yes. academics. For me, they fit very much into mm. that kind of group. And, and that, there yeah. were rules about yeah. what was acceptable yeah. and what was. Yeah, yeah. So it can be quite um, yeah, limiting, I would say. Sorry, good. Yes. Our table, we're looking at the online space. Yes. Yes, there are rules and norms of what is allowed in the public domain. Yes. But sometimes those very rules are being utilized to discourage this dissonance or experimentation. So, for example, if you're participating in a proprietary online course, you get a book of rules of, of what is allowed in this, uh, in this space. And then if you do say something that is so-called upsetting the, the particular group, you get a letter, a, a very a very polite email uh, to say that please, you know, tamper down. So, yeah. that also, does that fall into the same category? I think, I think perhaps it would, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's, it's sort of, um, I suppose, constraining, you know, people's ability to experiment beyond certain categories. Yeah. So the second approach, so that was the affirmative approach to um, misrecognition. The second approach would redress status subordination by deconstructing the sim symbolic oppositions that underlie currently institutionalized patterns of cultural value. Far from simply raising the self-esteem of the misrecognized, it would destabilize existing status differentiations and change everyone's self-identity. To illustrate 
considered two alternative strategies for remedying heterosexism. Gay identity politics, which aims to revalue gay and lesbian sexuality, and queer politics, which proposes to deconstruct binary opposition between homosexuality and heterosexuality. So she's, she obviously is sort of arguing for a deconstruction of binary you know, opposites. To say, no, we must, the categories themselves are problematic. We must go beyond categories. Whereas the first affirmative approach seeks to enhance the standing of the existing sexual orientation, um, like gay pride, for example, the second transformative one would destabilize the current grid of mutually exclusive sexual statuses. Shall we move on? So, um, redistribution and recognition don't mirror each other, but they do interact, as we heard in that group. You know, the one can, you can get situations where both are pertinent and both are um, impacting on each other. So, neither class or economics nor culture can explain social justice and in. Justice. This is why she had this two-dimensional. But now she thinks that this two-dimension doesn't go far enough. So she's brought in this third political dimension. And she says this dimension concerns social belonging. It's, this dimension is all about who counts as a member of a community, who is included and who is excluded of those entitled to a just distribution. So it tells us who in the first place can make claims for social justice and how such claims are adjudicated. So misrepresentation happens when some people are wrongly denied the possibility of participating as equals in social interaction. And she says there are two types of um, representation. There's ordinary political misrepresentation, like, um, for example, in South Africa, when all black people were excluded from voting in this country. That's the ordinary political. And then secondly, there's misframing, which constitutes members and non-members in matters of redistribution, recognition, and ordinary political representation. And she says this is the very most serious type of injustice. It's a kind of political death because you are not even in the you, you're not even included as a rights bearer. So can we now for the last time I'm going to ask you to do this, what are South African issues which impact on who is included in the political um, community and who can air their claims? And are there some communities that are wrongly excluded? For the last time. And if you need any clarification about this, please ask. Because it's not something which is very easy to understand. These two forms, I told you there's the ordinary form and there's the form where you are totally excluded. I can give you an example. In, in Nazi Germany, if you were Jewish, you were totally excluded from everything. So you couldn't even go there and say, make any claims. You, you couldn't say, um, you know, I've been ex can, I, can I get some economic help or, or recognition or anything? You are just politically dead as far as that regime is concerned. So are there, are there such communities that are being excluded in our country? Yes, definitely. Although the policies, I think, have changed a bit. Like, I mean, people were excluded from schools and from getting social um, benefits and that sort of thing. But I'm not sure. I think it might have changed somewhat. Yeah, in some areas. Yeah.
But if one thinks of people at universities, you know, um, I suppose those who don't get the requisite marks are totally excluded from universities. You know, and that's a huge swathe of people.